Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this uh, presentation from the Institution of Mechanical Engineers Automobile Division. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all here tonight. Uh, my name is Andrew Fraser. I'm the, uh, the chairman of the Automobile Division, and we're uh, delighted to be bringing this presentation to you this evening. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in it. Uh, we've got a large audience, uh, so we're looking forward to a very uh, interactive event. Uh, our speaker will talk for around uh, uh, 40 minutes, and then we'll have a, a question and answer session uh, following his presentation. Uh, and you have the opportunity, there's the uh, box on the side of your screens where you can uh, uh, ask questions, and I will then put them to the, the speaker at the end. I say we are, we have a quite a large audience, so we're expecting quite a number of questions. So apologies in advance if your question doesn't get uh, asked or answered. Uh, I'll do my best to pick out some, some key ones from the list as we go through the event, but please do submit them and we'll have a lively discussion at the end. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, our speaker tonight. Uh, he's uh, Mr. Andrew Mottram. Uh, he's the chief engineer of the global uh, e-transit program for Ford Motor Company. Uh, quite a major uh, role in the automotive engineering world. So we're uh, honored to have him with us here tonight. He's, he's right in the middle of launching this product, uh, a very critical time. So uh, uh, particularly thankful to him for making the, the time to uh, construct and present this. He's also assisted by another colleague, uh, Tim Winstanley, who is the commercial vehicle hardware integration manager, uh, also for Ford, of course. Uh, Tim has also been a, a key player in this project and in this presentation. And in the question session, Tim will be uh, assisting Andrew with any uh, key technical questions. Uh, An Andrew's an um, aerospace engineer by background. He did his degree at uh, Imperial College uh, and is now uh, found himself in a, in a senior role in the automotive industry. So without further ado, Andrew, uh, welcome. Thanks again, and uh, over to you for your presentation. Okay, uh, thank you, Andrew. That's great for that good introduction. And uh, as I say, I'll move on uh, and talk a little bit about the e-transit and the program, which I think I've been working on now for close to three years. And as you say, is uh, on the verge of launching around the world. So <clears throat> I guess first thing, so background, way of introduction. This, I think everybody would recognize, you know, this, we're rapidly um, running into an era of electrification. Things are moving, I think, faster than anybody might have imagined, even when we started this pro project two or three years ago. Uh, from a Ford perspective, we've committed to having 100% of our commercial vehicle range be zero emission capable by 2024, which is, of course, only a couple of years away now. And that mean, by that we mean available as either all EV, fully electric, or plug-in hybrid versions. Uh, you can see there, I think, and I think this forecast is itself a little out of date. It's about a year old now. Um, at that point in time, we expected around six, about two-thirds of commercial vehicle sales in Europe to be uh, fully electric or plug-in hybrid by the end of the decade. Uh, I think you know everything we've seen in terms of the interest in the e-transit. And the way the market is developing says that may even happen faster than that. Okay. A little bit more in terms of the external environment. Obviously, again, people I'm sure recognize, you know, there's a lot of demand and ever increasing demand from customers and governments, other stakeholders around electric vehicles, primarily driven by desire to reduce CO2, decarbonize the energy system, improve air quality, and in the case of a lot of our customers, particularly for the commercial vehicles, where they tend to be, or a large proportion of them are big fleets running big businesses, they often have their own sustainability commitments that they're looking for their vehicles to contribute towards. Um, electric commercial vehicles, from a point of view of improving air quality and reducing CO2, they, they, they are a really great opportunity in, in the way that they're a much bigger lever to pull on than passenger cars. They typically travel around 50% further than a passenger car. And thank you for Andrew Fraser for the data on this, but uh, Department for Transport says typical commercial vehicle in the UK travels around 13,000 miles a year, which compares to an average only around 8,000 for cars. And I strongly suspect if that data were to be published post COVID, those numbers would be even further apart. And the other thing we've seen obviously over the past couple of years, particularly with COVID is, you know, big explosion in e-commerce and uh, delivery fleets for supermarkets, parcels, and all sorts of things growing even faster than they were before the pandemic. 
um, which all contributes still more to the fact that uh, these vehicles are used very extensively in urban areas, often for at least eight hours a day, and sometimes when they're running two or three shifts for almost every hour of the day. And then on top of the fact that they're used more and travel further, they also, because they tend to be carrying a heavy payload and they're big vehicles, typically use around 50% more fuel than a passenger car. What that means in reality in terms of re reducing CO2 is that sort of every e-transit that replaces a diesel commercial vehicle of similar size is reducing CO2 to the same, to sort of, you know, value of the CO2 it's reducing is worth two, nearly two and a half passenger cars converting from uh, combustion to electric. Okay, so then talk a little bit about the strategy when we pulled the, uh, formulated the e-transit program and the project. So coming from what I was just saying around uh, commercial vehicles representing a big lever to pull on in terms of delivering CO2 improvements and uh, getting electric vehicles out into the market. Transit and Transit Custom were both among the top five best selling vehicles in the UK last year. They were fourth and first place respectively. Uh, Transit Custom was the number one selling and, and actually outsold the best selling passenger car by 25% or more than 25%, over 10,000 units more than Corsa that was in the second place. And Transit was uh, very narrowly, basically pretty much tied for third place with the uh, Tesla 3, which was the leading EV sales in vehicles last year. So again, shows you that uh, a lot of people out there buying transits and uh, giving them the opportunity to move to an electric vehicle represented a big opportunity. Again, same point made before, but those the combination of a lot of vehicles sold and the very high mileage that the vehicles tend to cover means that it really can contribute significantly to CO2 reductions and air quality. Why did we take the existing transit? Well, by using the existing platform, it gave us a number of, uh, of key things. Firstly, it meant we could be faster to the market. Secondly, it meant we had a global manufacturing footprint. Talk a bit more about that in future slides, but uh, as Andrew mentioned, you know, we're launching it right now for a multitude of markets on all over the planet. Uh, it also meant that we had an, an quick and easy ability to offer a whole array of body styles and different derivatives. I think you know, people I'm sure recognize transit comes in a, a vast variety of flavors and uh, we had easy access to that as well. And uh, that in turn meant that, uh, or combined with the fact that there's a well-established plethora of companies out there who make their living doing upfits and conversions on transits to tailor them to a particular business's needs. Those two things mean that it was by taking the existing transit and electrifying it, we had our maximum ability to address the needs of customers across a huge range of vocations, be that parcel delivery, supermarket delivery, what we call a rolling toolbox, which is kind of your utilities or tradespeople, construction and those kind of things. Okay. Talk a little bit about, you know, and I won't read all of these, but the e-transit's the e customer needs. Some of these, and again, this is another good argument for why, why take the existing transit and turn it into an EV. Some of these are you know, already strengths of the transit, <clears throat> like the uncompromised load and payload and uh, multiple variants that are and reliable, durable. Others you know, very clearly are electric vehicle related in terms of making sure we were able to provide sufficient range, quick and easy charging and that it offered an improved total cost of ownership, which is a, a key factor in most commercial vehicle operators' calculation of uh, what vehicle they choose to purchase. All right. So talk a little bit. So what we did, we and this is something Ford does with all of its programs, we kind of define for ourselves what does the, what does the ideal customer look like for this vehicle? And you can see on here a handful of bullet points that just summarize what our uh, <coughs> model customer for the e-transit looks like in terms of, and you can see it's it's kind of the kind of things that fit for an awful lot of commercial vehicle customers and make those customers ideally suited to moving over to being electrified. So planned predictable routes, so you, you have a very good idea of how much mileage the vehicle is going to do every day. Frequent stops, high idle times, so that the benefit versus 
an internal combustion engine is maximized. Uh, average daily usage cycle <coughs> says here 100 miles, 160 kilometers, seeing as you know, that was the sweet spot. That's actually getting on for double or one and a half times to double what the average commercial vehicle driver covers in a day. Typically, that's in the 80 to 100 kilometers a day range based on the data we have from uh, transits out there in the field right now and how, how we see them you know, being used and the distances they're traveling. But obviously, that's an average. You know, on a daily basis, they will do a little bit more some days and a little bit less other days, hence looking for uh, that kind of range. Just if they're using that or similar on a daily basis, they're ideally suited for uh, an electrified vehicle. And then key one there, sufficient daily dine, daily downtime to allow for AC charging. So basically, you know, if the vehicle is running 24 seven, you're gonna struggle. But if, uh, if it has six to eight hours overnight where it can be plugged in and charging and then ready to go the next day, that's perfect. Okay, and without further ado, hopefully it all works. We have a little video that shall help introduce the e-transit. So here we go, playing on. So coming in here, you can see the, the rear suspension, all new. Talk a bit more about that in depth in a minute. The battery and e-motor coming in, packaged underneath the vehicle without intruding onto the load space and allowing maximum compatibility with all the different upfits, racking, etc., that tend to get fitted to transits. And then lastly there, you can see just going in on the IP, the new touch screen, which, uh, which helps control and, and provide data on some of the uh, EV specific features and content that uh, we have on the vehicle. And talk through more of those in a bit, but I thought that was a, a nice little animation showing the vehicle coming together. Okay, <coughs> sorry, a little bit on, and I won't read through all of these, but you know, some key attributes. Again, some of these are, are things that, you know, a core to transit and a lot of, and then a lot of the others are, are inherent to the EV. Headline one on there, you know, class leading WLTP range, 317 kilometers. Obviously that does vary by the different derivatives. That one's uh, low roof, medium wheelbase. But uh, the key point there is it gives significant headroom to that 100 mile, 160 kilometer target for the customers that we see as, as what they're likely to use the vehicle. Um, and that gives you headroom for the occasional longer journey allows for the fact that you know the vehicles will spend time fully laden where WLTP is not always isn't fully laden and also uh, provides robustness against cold temperatures and things which degrade the battery performance uh, give some context around that directionally versus uh, the WLTP that's done at uh, you know, an average temperature um, at, a, at a freezing so at zero degrees C you lose about a third of the range from the battery uh, some other key things to point out, so rear wheel drive, uh, that was seen by a lot of the customers for two ton vehicle as highly desirable, um, as particularly for the countries where they have uh, lots of snow and ice because it delivers better traction when the vehicle is fully laden. Uh, very powerful motor, this has come to be expected in uh, EVs. Although we do offer two, although the torque, the torque at 413 newton meters is common, there are two different power levels available, 135 kilowatt and 198 kilowatt. Um, some very generous payloads, even with the weight of the battery. So a little under 1800 kilos for the van and a little over two tons for the chassis cab. It's available in three different GVMs and uh, on the lightest versions that are legally allowed to do so, it's capable of up to 130 kilometers per hour. Okay, this uh, gives you a little taste of uh, all the different versions. So there are actually three different lengths of vehicle, two different roof heights, the three body styles you see there, van, dual cabin van, which has two rows of seating, and the chassis cab that then gets converted with boxes on the back for your refrigerated supermarket delivery or other such things and the three GVM derivatives, as I said, on the prior slide. In total, there's over 25 different variants that customers can order, which I think just reinforces the point I was making earlier about uh, 
the versatility of transit and being able to address the needs of a whole wide range of customers. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so, you know, we live in a connected world and uh, e-transit is a fully connected vehicle. There's an onboard modem, provides access to the Ford Pass Pro app and Ford Telematics tools for customers that uh, subscribe to that. <coughs> and there is also access to some of the data for third party telematics as well. Additionally, the modem does allow over the air updates, some of the key software on the vehicle so that the vehicle can continue to improve even after it's out in the, in the field with customers. Uh, in terms of the, the telematics that opens up a, a whole host of management tools for fleet managers, some examples of those here. Um, so you know, specifically that, you know, in the dashboard, there's a whole bunch of things like, you know, who's driving the vehicle, the state of health of the battery, the state of charge of the battery, whether they're on charge, where they are, where the vehicle is, all those kind of good things that allow fleet managers to keep track of what's going on with these vehicles. Um, <clears throat> the driver behavior that actually, you know, and I've, I've seen this in action, you can real time see you know, who in your fleet speeding and, uh, or, or whenever there's an incident that triggers any of the uh, interventions from some of the driver assistance, brake assist type technologies and that allows, allows the fleet manager to see those. They can also <coughs> um, control some of the vehicle functions directly from the telematics, so things like uh, scheduling, charging, et cetera. Okay, that button. So, go now talk a little bit in more detail about uh, how we put the transit, e-transit e together and how the architecture looks. So this is a, a look at the underbody layout for the van derivatives. So I think they're in sort of a blue gray color. You can see there's a, a big, what we refer to as the battery support cradle. That's a combination of steel and aluminium extrusions and effectively forms the interface between the battery and the existing underbody structure from the transit. It provides the rigidity for MVH and durability and also provides a side impact protection for the battery. Um, you can see the battery there mounted in the cradle, 68 kilowatt hour usable energy in the high, vol high voltage battery. It's a and I've got a, a view of the inside of the battery coming in a couple of slides time. There are two, a front and a rear module. Front module mounts uh, most of the auxiliary systems for the EV and the rear module includes the e-motor and an all new independent rear suspension. Again, I'll show you those in a little more detail in a second. For the chassis cab, so key point here, you know, extremely common with the van, basically the same wherever possible. Uh, front and rear modules are completely common. The, back, the battery itself is common. The big difference is in the battery support cradle, because obviously there isn't uh, quite the same structure there to attach to as there is on the uh, van versions and also the battery is a lot more exposed so you can see a much more substantial side impact protection there and uh, we've obviously got a few sci-fi fans in our vehicle architecture team because this bracket is forever christened the Battlestar Galactica bracket which uh, you can probably guess why okay so then a little look at the the inside of the battery so as I mentioned before 68 kilowatt hours usable energy 288 lithium ion cells in 10 arrays and you can see a, a closer up picture of one of the arrays underneath the battery you can see there so the eight of the arrays are effectively the same and then there are two slightly smaller ones in the nose of the battery <coughs> which is actually the back um, but in this picture it looks like the nose um, within the casing so there's uh, a lot of the battery control electronics are packaged within the case and underneath what you can see in the image is a liquid cooling system, which helps optimize the performance, particularly in uh, hot, very hot or very cold weather, and also helps to improve charging time by keeping the battery cool while we're flowing energy into the, to the battery. Okay, so this then, uh, the rear module. So we've got a, 
a very large cast extruded aluminium rear subframe. It's made of one very big aluminium casting that goes across the whole width of the vehicle, takes the bulk of the loads, two smaller ones that uh, you can just see in the, see here, if you can see my cursor with the, where the coil springs are, <coughs> and then some extrusions that perform the frame that the, the motor is mounted to. <coughs> um, that, uh, the motor itself, so primary drive unit, numbers there talked about before it includes a fully integrated inverter system controller that handles the dc to ac conversion for the motor close coupled mounted right on top of the motor which helps provide uh, optimal thermal paths and things for the uh, the currents that we're flowing to the motor and it's fully isolated within the rear subframe uh, the heavy duty semi-trailing arm independent rear suspension that was uh, a particularly challenging bit of the program. The uh, semi-trailing arms are the biggest and heaviest duty that Ford certainly have ever produced. Um, and actually we, we strongly believe it, it may well be the heaviest duty independent rear suspension that's uh, offered anywhere in the world at the moment. The only one we know that even comes close was the, uh, the military Hummer. <coughs> um, yeah, I think so then. If I go to the front module, so I'll start start at the bottom. So you can see pictures in situ, the, the top one with all the plumbing in place, the bottom one uh, on the left, the, the bottom one there with the, the stack in place minus the plumbing. And then on the right there, you can see a little exploded view. On the bottom of the stack is a, an extruded aluminium frame. We call the mega brace. Uh, has two functions. It uh, supports all this the high voltage componentry that you can see called out there. So the the charger, the heaters, AC compressors, etc., and also provides the structural stiffness and crash load paths in the engine bay. Uh, now there isn't an engine there. One one uh, interesting box I'll point out and then talk a bit more about later is. Uh, you can see the top arrow on the left pointing to a 2.3 kilowatt DC to AC converter as an optional feature. I say I'll talk a little bit more later in the presentation about uh, what that enables us to do to deliver for customers and, uh, and how we think that'll be a, a big bone for a lot of commercial vehicle customers, big bonus. All right, so that's that gives you a flavor of the architecture vehicle, how, how we turned the, the transit into a, the e-transit. Next couple of slides talk a little bit about testing and verification and, and the work we did uh, through most of last year, actually. So this uh, first picture of a uh, prototype build taking place in our technical center in Dunton in Essex. Um, as sort of Andrew alluded to earlier, this is a global program. We built prototypes in uh, Dunton in Essex, in our workshops in Cologne in Germany, and also in our uh, new models facility in Dearborn in the United States, Michigan. We did testing in the UK, in Europe, and in the US and Canada. All of the batteries for all the prototypes were actually assembled in our um, labs in Dearborn in Michigan and shipped to the various locations where the, vehicle, the prototypes were being built. As uh, you may have spotted when I said this was all taking place mostly through last year. This was all done in the middle of the COVID lockdown, which meant we got really good at watching builds on, on video and resolving any issues and things with uh, virtually. So here, a uh, little image gives you a, a sneak at uh, how the builds were done. So if, effectively the one on the left is a regular diesel transit. The one on the right, the blue grill being the giveaway, will become an e-transit prototype. And effectively, yeah, just strip the parts off the, the diesel one and move them all over to the, uh, along with the new parts to turn, uh, to build an, an e-transit. There are, there are a handful of uh, unique body and white brackets and things that, uh, that go on the e-transit version. So uh, that was the most expedient way to do it. As the, those of you that have been reading the little banners on the bottom of the pictures, so as well as testing, um, you know, the usual sort of sign-off testing and 
things that uh, we do with vehicles. <clears throat> we built 20 um, prototype vehicles. So part of our verification prototype program, which were then loaned or are still being loaned and, and with some selected fleet customers so that we could gather data on real world usage, how um, gives us an opportunity to learn, see how they use the vehicles in the field and also allowed these customers that all operate big fleets of transit, ICE transits today, to learn a bit about what it takes to operate an EVs, what the, uh, how they might need to adapt their operating patterns to suit and give them the confidence to uh, make the move to e-transit. So in terms of the, the, the those fleets that, that we've been working with and that have vehicles on test still right now. So they included parcel delivery, supermarket delivery, postal services, and also utilities. Uh, from a European perspective, we've done trials in the UK, Germany, and also Norway to make sure we got uh, a cold climate country. Um, <clears throat> overwhelmingly positive feedback, I would say, from, from all of those fleets and, and actually most of them have already placed some pretty substantial orders for e-transit. So next uh, coming up, we've got a, a little video again of some of the testing that the prototypes underwent, all uh, built around ensuring that e-transit uh, delivered the same durability and toughness that the, uh, the ICE transits are renowned the world over for. So in terms of what you see here in these, these images, a lot of that is durability testing at our proving ground in Lommel, Belgium. It's designed to replicate a lifetime of usage from our toughest customers. That's a salt spray the vehicle's going through there. Um, that lifetime of usage I mean, in, a, in a period of a few months, it's designed to replicate 240,000 kilometers of use and a 10 year life. You also see here uh, some of the cold weather work that we did in real cold weather and then here the lab cold climate work and this is the hot climate with all the uh, sun lamps on and things as well there you go <coughs> so while i was talking about uh, durability testing and things one, one point which I know is often uh, made around EVs as a key benefit versus ICE vehicles uh, is the fewer components to go wrong for the e-transit calculation the team have done says we've got around 90% fewer powertrain components than an equivalent diesel transit that all helps along with the uh, you know the lack of moving parts etc in the battery and EV component tree to contribute to a 40% lower servicing cost compared to the uh, diesel versions and also meant that we were able to offer uh, effectively an unlimited mileage service intervals. The vehicles come in for their annual safety inspection and that's all we need. It doesn't matter how many miles it's done in the intervening period. So no need for oil changes and fun things like that that we've all got used to with diesels. Okay, switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, manufacturing. So that's a, an aerial view of our joint venture plant, the Ford Autosem plant in Kocheli, Turkey. It's actually technically two plants on one site. It's where they build all of the transits and transit customs for the UK, Europe, and also a number of export markets around the world. As we alluded to at the start, e-transits also produced for North American markets in our Kansas City plant, Missouri, and actually some of you paying attention to the news may have spotted. We announced earlier this week, we've started shipping vehicles to customers on Monday. So the first ones will be in, uh, in customer hands in the coming days. And uh, for Europe, we should have vehicles in with customer hands uh, sometime next month. Okay. Okay, so then this is a little look inside the assembly. So one thing here, so all of the batteries, actually both in Coachelli and in uh, in Kansas City facilities, are assembled in-house. 
in Cacelli, it's in a dedicated area and it includes the in-house production of the battery casing, which it says there, that's a, it's a metal tray and it's manufactured using high-tech cold metal transfer welding to ensure we get the sealing required. Uh, there's a robotic application of the TEM thermal insulating material and the cooling system, also robot assembled into the battery case after that's applied. It's, a, as you can see from the, the little uh, graphics here, it's a very automated, lots of robots involved in the process. Uh, the arrays themselves are also assembled by a robot. And then uh, there's a high def, ultra high definition image processing robots that come along and handle all the quality control to make sure all the harnesses and battery controllers and connections are all correct and that the ceiling is, is good. And once that's all done, they're loaded onto an automatic guided vehicle by robot, not least of which because the battery weighs uh, around 900 kilos, so it's better part of a ton, <coughs> and uh, taken away to the final assembly. And then I have another, again, hopefully it works, little short video, there we go. So this, these are the, uh, the stations where the batteries are done. Can't see inside those. These are the um, high definition cameras that are doing the checking each and every connection within the battery. You see here, this is one of the AGVs. This one's delivering the, the battery cradle to the final assembly line and decking it directly from the AGV. Uh, same process for the battery. They come on, a, on an AGV from where the batteries are made and a slightly different part of the plant and are decked direct from the AGV into the vehicle at the end of the line. Okay, and then we'll finish there on that, that picture of the, the new 12 inch sink screen, which gives me a nice little segue to start to talk a, bit, a little bit about the e-transit customer experience. So we wanted e-transit to, to be familiar to all those who love their diesel or gasoline transits. But there are some unique elements. I'll talk a little bit about some of those. So cluster, um, it's a new, new cluster for the e-transit, a couple of new features. So there's power gauge, which shows, you can see there, there's the green section and then the 100 that effectively shows how much power you're using in the naught to 100 category as a percentage of the max available power. And then in the green tells you how much uh, the battery is being recovering energy from regenerative braking. <coughs> um, that replaces what would normally be the rev counter. Um, the other one, so what would, where you would normally see a temperature gauge, that's replaced with the power availability gauge that shows you if there's any D rate happening, if the battery or anything else is overheating. So it performs a similar kind of function. And of course, the, uh, there's a state of charge indicator where the fuel, fuel gauge would go, which brings us nicely over to charging. Uh, so we have a combo CCS charge socket mounted in the center of the grill. Uh, that was a, a key thing a lot of customers told us they wanted it center line so that it didn't matter which side the char charge box was located. Um, that CCS combo charger provides type two connection for AC charging and then also the two pin 400 volt DC connection for the DC fast charging. It's IP67 sealed with socket covers and door sealing to help protect the, uh, the connections against dirt and water and snow and ice and grit and all the other things that uh, transits get exposed to. And then you can see there's a little five segment indicator around the cable release button that from the outside of the vehicle gives you an idea of uh, how the vehicle's charge is progressing. In terms of charging itself, we've got a, a flexible set of charging options. Primary one on the left there, the Mode 3 AC charging, 11 kilowatt onboard charger, which is capable of charging the vehicle from 10%, you know, so bringing it home not quite empty to 100% in just a shade over seven hours, which was seen as perfect for, for the, a customer that's uh, leaving the vehicle overnight between two shifts of, and then for two shifts of operation during the day. Uh, DC fast charging when the customer needed, you know, energy in a hurry or for an emergency, extra boost or a very long journey. Uh, obviously, mainly for occasional use uh, is the, the final option on the right, the mode two AC charging, which is optional, but it does mean you can charge from a standard electrical supply. Uh, times vary depending 
by market on the electric supply in that country. Here in the UK, 13 amp socket in your house, it'll take 23 hours to charge the vehicle fully. If you can get a 32 amp circuit, you can do it in around 10 hours. In terms of the DC fast charging, 115 kilowatt max power capability means that uh, <clears throat> from around 15 to 80%, which is sort of the, the sweet spot for using DC charging, takes only a little over half an hour. Uh, one other key point there you can see in the bottom bullet is, uh, I mentioned this earlier, so scheduling can be, sh your charging can be scheduled via the sync screen, via the Ford Pass Pro or via the Ford Telematics, which means you can ensure that you know, either you're making use of cheap off-peak tariffs when you're charging the vehicle or that your, uh, your charging is set to finish right before you're due to take the vehicle out on its route and therefore that the, the battery is all fully charged and uh, warmed up and ready to go when you are. Okay, so regen braking, obviously that's a key thing for an EV, recovering the energy rather than losing its heat from the brakes. <clears throat> for the e-transit, we've got a couple of modes there that allow the customer to vary the amount of regen they get. So in uh, standard, you know, just in drive, you get a, a basic level of regen. If you press the L button in the center of the, the little rotary shifter, you can see there in the picture on the right, that switches to, uh, to a maximum regenerative mode that uh, can be used all the time if you want, but it's mainly there to help improve drivability if you're just descending steep gradients or if you're in heavy traffic where it's difficult to anticipate and therefore you want to to use max regen and avoid having to use the brakes. And one other way that you can actually change the regen extent is uh, if you tap the brake pedal after you've lifted off, there's a, there's two taps. So first tap gives you about half between the standard and the, the full maximum regen. And then the second tap takes you to the, the maximum level of regen. Um, it's really intuitive. Drivers that have used it find it really easy to use. Obvious because you're, you're used to tapping the brakes when you want to slow down. So it's, um, and really just helps drivers and customers get the most out of the uh, the vehicle and ensure they have they maximize range and efficiency okay what am i doing for time so we've also got um, some specific drive modes that you can access through the sync display key one again eco mode you can read the on the screen the little bits but it basically it limits the peak power has a softer accelerator map slows down the cruise control and limits the climate control loads, all of which, of course, then uh, then help again to maximize the efficiency and the range for the vehicle. Mentioned a little bit about scheduled charging. So we can also, again, via telematics, Ford Pass Pro app on your phone or, or the Sync HMI, schedule preconditioning, <clears throat> so which allows the battery and the cabin to be warmed up, cooled as required uh, ahead of you going out on your trip and thereby taking energy from the charge station rather than using the battery energy to warm up the cabin and warm up the battery. Okay, um, intelligent range. So, you know, if you talk to EV customers, that range anxiety is always a key thing and commercial customers are no different. Uh, one of the key things there is to make sure that they, they can trust the range that the vehicle is telling them they have remaining. So e-transit has a, a number of systems there designed to be to be smart and learn. So it, it's constantly monitoring how much energy is available, how much you're using real time, helps therefore predict real time more accurately. It can also pull data over the modem to look at weather forecasts, traffic conditions on the route ahead. It learns the driver's behaviors and all built that into uh, to provide a smart, intelligent calculation of uh, the range you're likely to achieve from the remaining energy in the battery. Uh, one not so noticeable to the people driving, but very noticeable if you'll uh, find yourself standing next to a transit uh, when it's maneuvering at low speed, legal requirement for all EVs. You've got the approaching vehicle audible system, AVAS. Uh, that will operate and it's intended to provide a, a pleasing but very noticeable sound um, for, that alerts people to the vehicle when it's moving forwards at speeds of uh, less than 15 miles per hour or when it's in reverse. In the US, actually, it's required to be operating even when the vehicle's stationary. 
And then lastly, I did mention uh, when we were looking at the high voltage stack at the front of the vehicle, we had a 2.3 kilowatt DC to AC inverter that customers could specify in the front of the vehicle. Uh, that's marketed as pro power on board. That's there to provide exportable power from the battery that customers can use either to plug in equipment and tools or for converters to use to power things like refrigeration units, etc. Uh, you can see at the bottom of the slide there, you know, an array of the kind of things that uh, you might expect a transit customer to be using and uh, all of which can be dealt with with uh, the available 2.3 kilowatts of power uh, and just means that uh, the customers don't need to bring a generator along with them and you know it would be some something of a waste to, to arrive in an electric vehicle and then fire up a diesel generator or a gas generator in order to do your work and with that I'll go back to where we started, say thank you. I think I'm almost bang on time. Absolutely outstanding. Uh, thank you, Andrew. That was that was really fascinating. You're spot on time indeed, 1841. Has uh, finally manages the total program for marks. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, we've had a, a great range of questions uh, flowing in through the, uh, the chat room. Uh, I'll do my best to uh, pick some of those relevant ones. Uh, as I said at the start, apologies, I won't get through uh, all of them, but I'll try and pick some which are representative of some which have come in uh, groups. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with the first one. I'll try and paraphrase. The first question really was, uh, what would you say the compromises were in using the existing platform rather than an all new architecture for the e-transit? Yeah. Um I mean, obviously there are there are compromises. Um, you've got a structure for the vehicle that was built around having the, the package space for an engine. Um, so we, I talked about the mega brace and the battery support cradle. If you were starting from ground up design, you would they wouldn't need to be nearly as substantial um, because you could build a lot of that structure into the the base vehicle architecture. So that's probably the, the main compromise you, that you make. Um, I would say <laughs> it would have been easier to do front wheel drive <laughs> um, because you could put the motor where the engine goes. But uh, as I said uh, at the time, that was a key uh, key want for a, a large chunk of our customers that uh, no, they, they really insisted rear wheel drive was the preference for a vehicle of this size and weight and indeed that's borne out by uh, the proportion of our diesel two-ton transits that are that are rear wheel drive andrew sorry i'll, I'll if i may just a slight yeah. take a lap for myself does the use of rear wheel drive give you a better turning circle as well does the front wheel articulation is the vehicle more maneuverable or, or is it the same between front and rear wheel drive <laughs> it's actually the same i i've I don't know what turning circle we'd have had if we'd done a front wheel drive e-transit, um, but for the for the diesel ones, it's very similar. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, you've talked about the uh, 2.4 kilowatt uh, pro power supply, mm -hmm. which is also available on the uh, electric uh, F-series truck. Uh, are, has Ford been able to share any other hardware or software features between the, the transit and the F-series? There, there is actually quite a number of the the different high voltage modules that you saw on that that front stack on top of the mega brace, and also inside the battery that are shared. Yes, I, w I would caution that uh, the F one fifty Lightning actually has, I think it's a seven point six kilowatt version of the, the same device. So uh, right. much, more, much more powerful than yeah. much more powerful. It's, it's actually, you know, um, touch wood, not something we've yet had to suffer in the UK, but uh, rolling blackouts and things are, and you know, you've seen, I'm sure last summer, Texas had, or last winter, Texas had days and days without power. So in the US, it's actually marketed that uh, pro power on board with seven and a bit kilowatts is capable of running most of the stuff within your house from directly from the, the vehicle. Quite a nice feature. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, the next question is uh, on passenger cars, uh, there's typically a break even point for CO2 between manufacture and operation of, of around uh, two years. Uh, 
have you calculated the CO2 break-even point for the electric transit versus the diesel version? A short answer is no. Um, what, I, what I know we have calculated and, and is a key consideration for commercial vehicle customers is the effectively the, the payback period on, you know, everybody recognizes there's a lot of additional cost in the batteries and things for an electric vehicle. And, you know, commercial vehicle customers want to understand do they get that back in terms of savings on fuel versus the electric energy and on lower servicing costs. And the answer is obviously it varies by fleet, but very definitely yes. And for the vast majority of fleets, well within the uh, lifespan that they expect to keep the vehicle for. Thank you. Uh, there's, a, there's a comment that the uh, you mentioned the top speed was 130 kph. Yep. Uh, if you've got an N1, three and a half ton. Yeah. Uh, the, the the question is, is that artificially limited? Because given the power it, of the motor, it, it would appear to achieve more than that. It, it is. It is. And, it, yeah. and is that an, an environmental feature, or due to some other reasons? Uh, environmental. Again, what what the customers wanted. Um, you know. Again. Lots of these are operated by large fleets. They uh, would rather their custom their drivers weren't exceeding the, the le legal speed limits. And 100, 130 is uh, enough to, to to match the legal limits. In the, le all, legal all, all the markets for transit. Yeah, pretty much across Europe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good point. Still, all you need to bring up uh, the uh, the battery cradle design. Uh, you, 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 sh you give great uh, examples of how that was installed in both the chassis cab and the van. Uh, does that offer you advantages in terms of uh, either fast battery replacement or swap out if, if a battery fix was required? Or are there advantages in that cradle design? Um, I, I mean, there are there are some advantages in the cradle design. I'm not sure. sure. In terms of the, the number of fixings between the battery and the cradle, they're the same as if we'd had we'd not had a cradle and we're mounting directly to a vehicle structure. So speed of swap out, and to be honest, in terms of the speed of swap out, the, you know, and we've we've done this a few times with the test vehicles and things, the limiting factor is actually the time it takes to to make the high voltage system safe for somebody to work on, disconnect everything, and put the new and then having put the new battery in, actually recommission and test everything and make sure the high voltage system is safe again. They take far longer than the mechanics of of unbolting it and bolting in a new one. Thank you. That's that's interesting. And uh, continuing on the the battery uh, insulation theme, we've got a, quite a lot of interest in this area. Uh, can you comment on any? And this might be one for Tim Brown. Any specific? Uh, CAE and physical assessments that are required uh, to demonstrate the, the battery uh, protection? I mean, yes. So uh, obviously Ford runs a whole suite of uh, CAE tests and physicals. Um, both, you know, there are, there are a number of legal requirements that you need to be able to meet in terms of pole impacts and barrier side impacts but the Ford standards go well above and beyond those. So we actually perform a series of pole impact CA assessments along the whole length of the battery to make sure that it didn't matter where you hit the telegraph pole, it was still uh, protecting the battery. Uh, there's also a, a lot of CAE done around the MVH that the, what having that uh, 900 kilo weight attached to the bottom of the vehicle does in terms of MVH and durability loads and Torsional rigidity of the vehicle, etc. So yeah, uh, definitely a lot of CAE that was done around the battery installation, and then proved out with the durability testing that you saw, and uh, some crash testing that I didn't show. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I guess I'll, again a linked comment. Uh, vans such as the Transit frequently use on construction sites with all sorts of ground level obstacles, uh, not not least mud and so on, but other physical uh, potential intrusions. Uh, you showed some of the torture testing in, in the video. Mm. Uh, were there any other particular uh, t uh, requirements around sort of construction site battery protection? Yeah, so there are some, there are some additional elements that we've added. Um, <clears throat> I 
I don't think you could see it visibly on any of the, the images we showed, but there's a, there's a catcher bar in front of the battery that's there to collect anything that, that makes it under the engine compartment before it gets to the battery. Effectively, it sits there between the rear, the, the front, or the rear of the front suspension members, um, and provides protection from rocks and debris and things to the battery. There's some skid plates on the battery as well that help protect it against uh, grounding out over railway crossings and those kind of things. For precisely those kind of reasons that yeah, transits, transits go places that passenger cars don't necessarily. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there's, a, there's a group of questions around the the topic of of weight. Uh, you touched on the, the payloads, uh, which do look very competitive. Uh, so the, the first question in this category is, how does the unladen weight of the electric variant compare with the diesels? Oh, goodness me. <laughs> Have I got that? Um, as I say, I know the, ba the battery's just a shade under 900 kilos. You lose the weight of the energy of the, of the engine. But again, Tim may know, but from memory, I, th I think we're about it's it's about 750 800 kilos heavier in terms of where we the, the lost payload so so the electric system does have quite a significant impact on the on the payload yeah the yeah i mean i mean you so sort of, you basically the if you ignore the battery it's very it's a little bit lighter than a diesel but then the battery adds 900 kilos <laughs> so that is quite a chunk of hardware, isn't it? Yeah. It is. <laughs> quite impressive. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and then, so continuing in that context, uh, did you look at any other uh, light weighting techniques, uh, such as uh, composites, perhaps, in the, the rear of subframe? Like you mentioned that it was largely an aluminium uh, casting. Were any composites considered? Uh, no, we didn't look at composites, um, main, mainly for you know a... Uh, a cost and also as i was alluding to it's uh it's a very heavy duty load for an independent rear suspension and sort of ford's experience with aluminium casting members is much greater than our experience with composites so i think we were you know from a risk reduction perspective much happier with it being aluminium personally as an aerospace engineer i'd love composites but <laughs> Yes, Alan, Alan Banks' team are doing some interesting stuff with the potential composite suspension mechanism. Yeah. Uh, possibly one that you may have to uh, defer, but I'll ask it because there are a couple in this area. Uh, broadly, how does the overall manufacturing cost of the e-transit uh, compare to the diesel variants? And is it possible for a manufacturer such as Ford to actually produce vehicles like this uh, at a profit? So again, short answer is yes, it is definitely possible to produce them at a profit. Indeed, that's what we're doing or in, intend to do. Um, they are, again, primarily because of the cost of the cells and the battery, more expensive to produce. But at least at the moment, because as I was alluding to, commercial customers with the mileage they do the energy saving fuel savings they get compared to the energy cost for the uh, e-transit provides them with a solid return on their investment for e-transit that means they are willing to pay and uh, that means we actually have very healthy margins on the uh, e-transit I, I go i go so far as to say that uh, actually in some markets the margins are better on the electric transit than they are on the Get ice. So customers are recognizing the total cost of ownership proposition and saying, okay, it's the capital cost is higher, but I, I save significantly the operating costs. So that's a big sure. bundle. Yeah. That's, and that's that's, that's maybe a key difference with uh, between a commercial vehicle customer and a passenger car customer that the vast bulk of commercial vehicle customers, that's exactly the calculation they're doing. They want to know the total cost of ownership. What's the initial outlay? You know, what's the residual value when I'm done with it? And what's the cost to provide it with energy and service it through its life. Mm, thank you. Uh, back to the uh, the motor and drive choice, there was a question about uh, what were the potential trade-offs between choosing one single motor with a differential versus possibly uh, applying uh, two motors uh, at, at the rear? Uh, was, was that combination ever considered? 
I think that's one where I'm going to let Tim uh, see if he can <laughs> give an answer. Um, yeah, so it's the, the, the simple answer is that that concentric drive motor um, was available within the company as, a, as an option and it, it was uh, the best overall match. So um, that's that's why we used it. Nice, concise uh, answer. Thank you, Tim. Uh, uh, interesting question, actually. Uh, for uh, vehicle re recovery type use or in the event that the various software systems aren't sufficient and a customer does find their battery completely flat, uh, is it possible to actually tow charge one of these vehicles? I, I pull it with another vehicle until it recovers charge or is that not feasible? Uh, how am I going to answer this? Technically, yes, but it's not recommended. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the answer is we have tried it. It does work, but we, we wouldn't uh, propose it as something we'd recommend. You're, you're better off taking the vehicle and towing it to a charge station Thank and you. charging it properly. Okay. Uh, and continuing on the on the charging theme, uh, you said that the uh, customers had uh, requested a, a central charging point, uh, which has to be at the front of the vehicle, therefore, in order to make it equally accessible to charging stations on either side of the vehicle. Are there any downsides in terms of, of crash protection? There's a comment that it looks quite vulnerable in terms of a, a relatively modest uh, front crash could disable the charging system. Uh, I mean, it, it is obviously, I, I don't know about relatively modest, it isn't damaged in the kind of low speed damageability tests that we do on vehicles, you know, that uh, all the insurance companies look at and things, obviously at a, at a higher speed, but then you've, you've probably damaged a lot more. <laughs> um, what I would say, you know, you know it, it is a compromise in terms of where you put it, you're never gonna, it's never gonna be the right place for everybody. Um, one of the use cases we, we have, we did find as part of our the, the fleet trials we've done with our prototypes is that there are some fleets, particularly where they're operating out of a loading dock and want to do their charging while the vehicle is in the loading dock. It's a slightly special case because obviously, you know, if you're going to leave a vehicle parked at the loading dock for six or seven hours, you've got to have a lot of loading docks. Um, but there are some where that's how they how they operate. And in that case, it would be much easier for them to have it at the back of the vehicle. Um, okay. so that's something we're, we're, we're looking at for the future of, of how we can provide the option. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so continuing on the, the front of the vehicle question, the uh, expanded views were excellent, but there, there wasn't a specific description of a, a radiator. Is, is there a traditional cooling system at the front to cool the battery? Yeah. Yes, there is. Sorry, I, obviously, you know, for, for clarity of vision and things, yeah. The, so there is a, there's actually both a radiator and an AC condenser that sits behind the grill exactly where you would expect to see it on a, a diesel or a gas transit. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and, and sorry, sorry I, just, I guess maybe that provides both, um, obviously, the, the, the AC condenser for the AC system, which cools both the cabin and the battery, and the radiator to help cool the battery. Excellent, thank you. Uh, the, uh, some manufacturers, uh, I think Porsche were first with the, the Taycan and High and I have now followed, uh, have gone up to an 800 volt uh, electrical architecture uh, with advantages for power and charging speed. Was that considered at all for the, the e-transit or is that something that's only in the future? Uh, it wasn't something that was considered for the e-transit. It's clearly something that we'll we'll keep paying attention to and, and how that develops in the future. And, you know, one of the things to bear in mind, of course, is um, charging infrastructure as well. And uh, at the moment, the bulk of that is built around 400 volt. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, uh, I guess perhaps final question really around architecture. You, you talked about maybe doing a, a front-wheel drive version and would have been potentially easier. Uh, have you also considered uh, an all-wheel drive version as there is currently with the ICE version? Um, we actually, not so much in here in Europe, but in, in the North America, there is evidence that there would be demand for it. It's not something we've currently looked at, but Never say never, I guess, is the because, you know, as I say, we are aware of some customers, particularly, you know, the, the snow belt states in the US and things where that would be attractive. 
yeah, that makes uh, makes good sense. Excellent, thank you. Uh, well, Andrew, brilliant. Uh, we are spot on seven o'clock. Uh, there were a few more questions lurking, but uh, I think I'll bring it to an end there, if I may. Uh, absolutely outstanding presentation. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, real insight into the, the rationale and the technical assumptions and the program execution for the, the e-transit. Uh, very impressive to see this sort of model being brought to market and the, as you said, really at the front of your presentation, the impact which electrifying uh, the commercial vehicle fleet can have due to the usage pattern of these vehicles and the, the benefits for urban air quality where delivery vans are very much a, a part of uh, everyday life these, these days. So uh, a really uh, determined effort by Ford. And again, uh, impressive to see it being rolled out on a, on a global basis as well, not just uh, in very niche markets, but uh, on a really large worldwide basis and seeing the OEMs with the scale of Ford being able to make that sort of impact in a relatively short space of time. Uh, so really on behalf of uh, the IMAC E, uh, all of our audience here tonight, uh, I apologize to those who posted questions that I didn't get a chance to uh, answer them all, but I hopefully we covered quite a good range. Uh, I think Andrew's excellent answers were those excellent. He was very open in his uh, responses. Uh, so uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, for your time in uh, preparing and uh, presenting this. I, I know it's like being a, a department manager at Ford in the middle of a launch. It's not an easy time to carve time out your schedule. So uh, massive thanks for, for doing that and for sharing that and uh, showing us uh, your, your, your pride in your product. Thanks again Thank you. and uh, we'll end there. Thank you. Thank you.